Jonathan, thank you for joining us. It's the start of day two, week two. Where are we with these talks? Well, the ministers are arriving today, uh, starting to come in here, and we need them to raise the stakes and step up to the plate and do what has to be done to get a positive outcome at the end of the week. The major issues are still what they were, the future of the Kyoto Protocol, whether there's going to be a process to develop a broader framework that includes the United States, China, other big emitters who aren't covered under Kyoto, and also what happens with finance. So those are the three big issues still on display here. We need political will from the ministers to close the deal, get an ambitious outcome from Durban. All three of those issues are still in play. Uh, there are options on the table. They're starting to engage. We're hoping with the presidency and ministers taking over now from negotiators, we can get political decisions on these big issues over the next several days. And what, what positions are the, are the big players taking here? We've heard some relatively positive signals coming from China, but then Connie Hedegaard of the EU saying maybe they're taking a less progressive line behind the scenes. What's, what positions are the big players taking here? Well, what, on, the, on the issue the EU is most concerned about, which is, I think, getting a roadmap or a process out of here to discuss a broader long-term treaty, what we hear from the informal discussions yesterday that of course we as observers weren't allowed into but we get pretty good intelligence out of is that the US, China and India are still raising uh, concerns about launching that process here for different reasons. China is saying they want all the options on the table, things from a new protocol, amendments, decisions. They want that all to be put into the LCA text tomorrow, the new version of the text, and then continue the discussions over the next year, but not decide here which of those that we're pursuing and actually launch a process. India, we're hearing, doesn't even want that. They want, it, they want to have just continued discussions about this without uh, any options being forwarded to the LCA and sort of put on the table for concrete discussions next year. And of course the U.S. is still where it's at. It doesn't think we need a discussion on legal form. It doesn't think the politics are there to launch a process out of Durban. Uh, it doesn't think much from what I've heard about the Chinese uh, sort of charm offensive in public that they've done over the last couple of days saying China would be willing to take on commitments after 2020. We'll hear more about that later today because we understand uh, Todd Stern is meeting with Minister Shea of China uh, this morning. So I think that's where it's, it stands. As far as we know, those three countries are still posing problems in getting a, a process out of here on Friday or Saturday morning, whenever it turns out to be, for different reasons. I think the question is whether the EU can lure China more on side with this over the next several days by responding to the five conditions that Minister Shea laid out on Sunday at the NGO meeting uh, and saying how Europe would be prepared to address those issues in the context of a negotiating process coming out of Durban. And what are China's red lines? We've had difficulty pinning down those conditions from press reports. What are they worried about? Well, what they mentioned five issues. First of all, they want a, a, a strong uh, signal from Europe and others on the KP. They want a ratifiable uh, Kyoto Protocol second commitment coming out of here. I don't think that's a problem for the Europeans if they get the right kind of mandate for the broader process. They want uh, more clarity on finance, both completion of the $30 billion fast start finance over the, next, the three years ending next year, as well as a little bit of a roadmap for how the developed countries plan to ramp up their finance towards the $100 billion goal that was put on the table by leaders in Copenhagen. Uh, third thing they want is a good set of decisions out of here on the Cancun agreements, things like setting up the Green Climate Fund, the technology mechanism, the adaptation framework, the other bits there that came out of, uh, out of Cancun. The fourth thing they want is to get a prompt start on this science review that was agreed in, in uh, Cancun and is supposed to wrap up no later than 2015 about uh, the adequacy of the pledges that are currently on the table to meet the two degree target and what it would take to try to set a 1.5 degree target as AOSIS was calling for the small island states in Cancun. Um, those are the, the four they mentioned and then the fifth would be to make sure that if we do launch a negotiating process it's based on the principles of common but differentiated responsibility, equity and historical responsibility. So those are their five conditions. Obviously there's different dynamics around each of them. I think the one that probably is the most problematic, uh, partly because of opposition from the U.S., is their call for a roadmap on how we're going to get up to $100 billion in climate finance by 2020. The U.S., we understand, is, is, is vehemently resisting a decision here that would call on the developed countries to make clearer over the next year where they're going to generate those sums of money. And we started off last week with uproar from campaigners here about Canada's position. This week it seems to have been a bit quieter. Have they been sidelined or marginalised? Well, I, I think there was a reaction to the rumours they were going to pull out of Kyoto. Yesterday they made clear that they don't intend to have a commitment under Kyoto. 
Uh, I think they're still being silent on this on this pulling out uh, business. Uh, I think Canada, that was a little bit of a sideshow. Obviously, they're they're uh, doing some pretty outrageous things in in terms of first saying they're not going to meet their current commitments under Kyoto. Second, they put very weak targets on the table for 2020. And third, this rumor that around Christmas they might pull out entirely. But when you step back from that, China's two per, uh, Canada's two percent of global emissions. They're not a heavyweight in these negotiations in terms of the ones that have to be at the table to, be, to make the deal. It's really the EU, the basic countries, uh, the small island states and, and vulnerable countries in the LDCs and the U.S. I mean, that's sort of the negotiating blocks that really have to fall into alignment to get a deal. So I think the focus has shifted uh, away a bit from uh, Canada towards uh, the position of China, India, Brazil, the U.S. You know, can we get these countries to move into more alignment with AOSIS, the LDCs, the European Union to get the kind of ambitious package at the end of the week we need. And as a veteran of these talks, at this stage, do they seem to be going relatively well, just with the politicians arriving? Well, yeah, I mean, this is where it usually is. You've, you've gotten progress, mixed progress, on the sort of more technical issues and, and on things like adaptation and deforestation, the Red Agreement, uh, uh, capacity building, technology. There's some pretty good movement. Looks like we could have those elements in place if the broader package falls into line. And we're really starting to sort down to the, the inherently political issues of Kyoto, uh, the long-term legal treaty and finance as the crunch issues that really ministers are the only ones that can grapple with because they're inherently political compromises that are needed. Negotiators don't have those mandates from their uh, from their uh, foreign affairs office or the heads of state to make those compromises. It really is a ministerial job now. And is it going to play out uh, okay, do you think, or are we looking at fireworks in the next couple of days? Oh, I would imagine there will be fireworks. I mean, there, there are some pretty strong uh, disagreements still on the table. But the question is, uh, uh, can the South African presidency get the ministers to work collaboratively to try to resolve some of these issues? And the phrase is, of course, it's nothing's agreed till everything's agreed. So we won't know until the very end of the day whether there's a balanced package in place and the compromises have been made to get us a fairly ambitious deal out of here. I'm still maintaining hope. Uh, but it's certainly not a done deal. There's a lot of hard work and a lot of changes in countries' positions that are needed over the next several days if we're going to get there. Alden, thanks for speaking to us. Sure.